By now it's probably become clear that the elements display periodic properties, and we can organize the elements by laying them in rows that are the periods and stacking the periods on top of one another into columns. In this video we're going to look at the structure of the periodic table and discuss the model of the atom that comes out of electron affinity and ionization energy and these other periodic trends that we see. So to put it all together, what we've seen is that electrons within the atom appear to come in groups. So we have the nucleus at the center with some positive charge, and as we add electrons to the atom, as we increase atomic number and add more electrons, they start out fairly close to the nucleus and actually get a bit closer to the nucleus as we add them in, according to Coulomb's law and the ionization energies. And then at some point, once we've added enough electrons, there's a big jump in ionization energy and we move out further, start adding electrons even further out, and so on and so forth. And this process continues. Electrons appear to be grouped into what are called shells at approximately the same distance from the nucleus. Electrons within the same shell have similar distances from the nucleus and similar energies. That's suggested certainly by the ionization energies. Across different shells, certain elements appear to correspond in their properties. A good example is the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So for example, if we focus just on the outermost shell for all of these elements, the outermost shell for all of these elements appears to have seven electrons, since the jump in ionization energy happens at the seventh ionization energy for all of the halogens. All of the halogens are characterized by this kind of electronic shell structure. These are the corresponding elements within different periods just like the corresponding points on a sine function, for example. And the periodic table is the organizational device that enables us to use periodic trends to make predictions of elemental properties. So here's the periodic table in all of its glory with all of the different elements color-coded. The rows are the periods, and there's nothing fancy there. This is exactly synonymous with, for example, the period of a sine function or the period of a cosine function. The columns are called groups and the elements within a group correspond within the different periods. One thing to notice about the periods is that they actually have different lengths. So the first period only consists of two elements. The second and third have eight each. There's that number eight coming in again. And the fourth period actually has 18 elements as we move across. The fifth has 18 as well. And we actually get 32 elements across the sixth and seventh periods with the addition of the lanthanides and the actinides in there. Each group has a historical name that you should familiarize yourself with. Just to go over these very briefly, the first group, group one, is known as the alkali metals. Second group is the alkaline earth metals. The 13th group, you'll often hear referred to as the boron group or just group 13. The ones over here have less common names. The oxygen group is called the chalcogens. Here we have the halogens and group 18 is known as the noble or inert gases, and the chunk between group 2 and group 13 is known as the transition metals. That's this chunk that I'm boxing here in blue. Familiarize yourself with these names. As I alluded to before, we arrange the elements this way so that periodic trends are easy for us to spot, and we can look at the relative positions of two elements in the periodic table to make predictions about their relative properties. We already saw for the example of the halogens the importance of this outermost shell of electrons. It's called the valence shell because it's elec those electrons are used for bonding, as we'll see in a later video series. The inner shells are called core shells. And remember, these contain the electrons that are hardest to remove from the atom because they have the largest coulombic energy. In terms of the properties of the elements as a function of their position on the periodic table, the picture to keep in mind is the one right here. Most of the elements, everything on the left-hand side of the periodic table, with the exception of hydrogen, are metals, with a few metalloids in blue sprinkled in. Metals are generally silvery, lustry, electrical conductors, and all that kind of stuff. The metalloids are kind of halfway in between. Silicon, for example, is a semiconductor, not a great conductor of electricity, but it can conduct under some circumstances. The elements on the right-hand side in this tan color are known as nonmetals, and they are not metals in their state at normal room temperature and pressure. So, for example, we saw carbon and nitrogen. Diamond is definitely not a metal, and of course, nitrogen gas and even liquid nitrogen 
don't look like metals either. These are the non-metals.